relevance of native speaker norms. That's a question for philologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for philologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? Feedback to learner autonomy. We'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Hi, Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Tephalology podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephalologists. Tefl News. Okay, so uh, for this week's Tefl News, um, well, it doesn't really have a doesn't really have a title, but maybe we'll find a title by the end. Um, in fact, it's not really news, to be honest. Um, it's it's certainly current, but it's 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 probably not news. Um, but anyway, we'll again we'll we'll find out as we go. Okay, so we all um, so obviously we've talked about before how as as language teachers, we're a lot of us are having to move our classes online this year. Um, and also a great deal of conferences are also being hosted online too. Um, I think we've we've all attended at least a few, well, two or three conferences each online recently. Nope. Um, <clears throat> hasn't. Li- li- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, one and a half or one and a quarter, I'd say. Yeah, Rob, I mean, Rob doesn't like conferences at the best of times and you're still reluctant to attend any online too. No, well, I mean, you know, um, why compound the misery? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But anyway, like, so so I, I guess, yeah, we've already discussed um, teaching online a lot. I mean, that's, you know, we've, we've covered that, I guess, and um, conferences we've touched upon. But I, I guess, like, I, I kind of want to have a discussion today about how, what this might all mean for professional development and teacher development and could there be any opportunities out of you know being physically distant from one another and you know the kind of the lockdown situation that a lot of us have had so that's kind of my topic today talking about how how this although it's an unfortunate situation that we're in thinking about if there might be some kind of opportunities that can come out of it as well so that's kind of my topic at the moment so i've I've just written a few notes to lead us into our discussion so something i've noticed and we'll, we'll maybe you have some examples about this too is there seems to be a quite a large uptake in the amount of content that's being produced um since kind of since march i guess there's been a lot of new podcast uh shows being created um do you guys know of any that you've listened to that have started as a result of of the coronavirus pandemic um you mean tefl related podcasts Um, just in general maybe generally speaking it's hard to say if they were created if they wouldn't have been created were it not for uh everyone being at home but yeah i'm not not that i can not that i can point to really yeah. Rob, do you have any, any ideas? Yeah, not really. Um, I've, I've noticed um, a lot of uh, TEFL podcasts being shared on Twitter. Um, and th- they've all, I mean, similar to us, you know, they've been focused on like um, remote learning or emergency mm-hmm. online teaching. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the things we covered last episode um, to do with racism and ELT and that kind of thing. So I can see a lot of podcasts being produced, which kind of reacting to the moment, but I can't think of any that started um, as a result of lockdown. Yeah. The, I mean, the one example for me that jumps to mind is uh, the the British journalist, I guess, document, is it documentarian or document? I don't know. I don't know what the word is. Mm-hmm. Documentarian. Documentarian. Okay. Uh, Louis Theroux, he, he started a new podcast. Um, mm-hmm very much out of the situation of being in lockdown. Uh, so that's that's mm-hmm. one example that jumps to mind. So I, I, anyway, the point I'm trying to get at is there seems to be, out of this kind of isolation, people have seemed to be getting a bit more creative and wanting to reach out to people. 
and as a result kind of produce content as well mm. I, I guess we're not really part of that because we've been we've been doing this for so many years but uh <laughs> yeah We've been in uh, self-enforced lockdown for years, <laughs> the three of us. We've been in isolation the whole time, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, of course, there's also been a lot of conferences that have, or pre-existing conferences uh, that have moved online. But there also seems to be a lot of events that have been arranged kind of as a result of the, the situation. A couple that jumped to mind is uh, Jelt recently had a series of webinars about teaching online. And I also came across a webinar series called Decentering ELT, which was arranged by TESOL Africa. Hmm. And I can't be sure, but I think that that was probably arranged as well out of this situation. Okay. But I'm not sure. I don't know. The point that I'm eventually going to get to, and we'll, we'll talk about it, is, um, yeah, there seems to be kind of more creative, there seems to be a, a level of creativity that's uh, coming about as a result of this isolation. And there's a lot of new opportunities that are, that are taking place. Yeah, I guess um, what, one thing I've seen quite a lot of it, it is not, not so much individuals, but I've seen lots of companies like Cambridge University Press um, sharing, I mean, using it as kind of pseudo solidarity, pseudo, um, you know, but, but really kind of, I guess promotional, but you know, sharing lots of resources for teaching online, um, which you know is it, kind of it's kind of nice. Like as soon as the sort of lockdown situation started, I, I was getting emails like you know every day or every couple of days from various different companies that I didn't even know had I didn't even know had my email address, um, <laughs> and they were all sharing you know their webinars and their tips for online teaching and all that kind of thing, um, and I thought that was you know pretty pretty good really. Um, although, as I say, I think probably the 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 real reason was uh, was promoting their brand. You know, hey, look look at us, the altruistic the altruistic company that you can trust. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's been there's been quite a number of kind of independent projects and initiatives that have that have started of late. Um, one that I came across this weekend actually is a a series of interview live Zoom interviews called we're we're all in this together have you have you come across that no no it's it's made by i think they're based in argentina they're def they're definitely in south america um by a couple called alistair grant and maria florencia Clarf clarfeld i hope i'm saying that right um but they're they're doing live zoom interviews that they also stream through facebook and instagram and just in the last I think two or three weeks. It's pretty. It's pretty new, as far as I can tell. They've they've interviewed Stephen Crashin, Sarah Mercer, Adrian Underhill, and I think yesterday was Jeremy Harmer. Mm. Mm. And it seems to have a very big following. Um, so that's that's one example of, that's come out of kind of this lockdown situation. Another one that was perhaps kind of back in March that I came across this was language learning lives, which I think you know about as well, Rob. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I and shared a, on Facebook, I think. And that's a YouTube channel by Ronaldo Gomez Jr. And yeah, the, he's also interviewed Stephen Krashen as well. And uh, Diane Larson Freeman and Richard Smith, friends of the show. Mm, except for but, Stephen Krashen. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> he's eluded us as yet, yeah. but you know, he might be, he seems like he's on the case at the moment, so we could we should try and interview him. Do you think he's requesting to be interviewed by people? I wonder, I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, out out of this lockdown situation, there's there seems to be kind of conversations taking place, people trying to make connections with each other, and yeah, people producing content as well. So my question is, I wonder what this means for the for the so-called research teacher or researcher and teacher divide so i want to open that question up to you both hmm i wonder i think i mean i think part of it is just uh i think the you know for the last however many years five ten years um a lot of teachers have been very active online you know bl writing blogs and mm -hmm. i guess podcasts and and webinars and that kind of stuff it's you know it's been going on and there are some teachers who are and have been very passionate about it 
Um, and I guess there's a sense of, you know, sort of their time has come and, and we're all sort of in a position where if we are looking for, you know, conferences to attend or that or that sort of thing or, or some sort of, yeah, I guess professional development or, or something to, you know, to, to, you know, that can grab our interest or, or motivate us or inspire us in terms of our teaching. Um, that's really the only place we can look at the moment. Um, in terms of the, the teacher and researcher thing, yeah, I wonder. I think, I mean, obviously there's, I'm sure there's a lot of research going on right now into online teaching, and I'm sure we'll see plenty of articles about it. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine exactly what that means yet. Yeah, so I mean, it's all kind of conjecture at the moment because we're still cu currently living it. But I, I wonder what changes to teacher and professional development will come out of this situation. Because mm. previously, you know, people didn't go to conferences because maybe they were put off by the fact that they had to travel somewhere. Um, they weren't being reimbursed by their institute or supported by their institution. Perhaps there was kind of a there were certain certain barriers in place, you know, maybe certain images of going to conferences and taking part in these kind of activities. But now, I mean, things have shifted and I don't know, there, 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 there's kind of fewer excuses for kind of taking part. Although Rob mm. hasn't, Rob hasn't been to any <laughs> online conferences. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, don't, don't need an excuse. All right. I, don't know, I think, I think the issues that, that some people have with conferences. I think they're still there with online conferences. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess there is a factor. I like, yeah. So I mentioned I've been to a couple and the one I went to last week, I guess it was, um, I attended most of the sessions, I think. And I kept my sort of my camera on for most of the sessions that I was in or all of them, including one where I was, you know, I, I moved my, laptop and everything to the kitchen where I was cooking dinner. I just kept the camera on me as I was cooking. <laughs> um, and I kind of felt like it was, I don't know, I, you know, nothing, I, I don't have a problem with people who sort of lurk at the, in a Zoom meeting or, you know, keep their cameras off and there's all kinds of reasons. And, and actually that's what I did at the, the, the few sessions at the conference this weekend is I almost never had my camera on. Um, and was just sort of lurking just the whole, the whole time camera off and microphone off. Um, but I think there's the same sort of issues in terms of, you know, if you don't know, if you don't know people there, it's a little, can be a little off putting when everybody seems very friendly with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly the, the factor where you can, you can just have it on, you know, you don't even have to be paying attention necessarily. You can just have it on while you do other work and if something or you can cook you know and if something grabs your attention you can focus on it um but yeah. like you said it, it doesn't require the time commitment as a as a face-to-face -face conference yeah yeah i guess i mean i guess it's less about the talking about i, I guess what i'm kind of thinking about today is less about the conference itself more about the fact that kind of out of this situation that we're in people are by and large trying to connect with one another more i know that i've certainly i've spoken to my friends in the uk that i could have done prior to this but th there's something about this situation that kind of compelled us to want to have a zoom chat with each other and it seems in our profession yeah there's i mean i've, I've given a couple of examples but it seems like there is there's a, a tiny bit of an uptake in the amount of kind of new conversations that are taking place. Hmm. Well, I think a lot of teachers, you know, enjoy the, you know, being in a, in a staff room or, or seeing their colleagues every day and just having little chats. And that, like you said, that is a part of professional development. There's, there's sort of yeah. between yeah. class chats you have, or, you know, grabbing lunch on campus or whatever. And so, yeah, well, I guess we're looking for ways to, to replace that. Hmm. Rob, do you have anything to, to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I, well, as, as we've, uh, as we've said, I, I, I haven't been to any of these conferences, but one way that, um, I've been doing online, um, interaction with other teachers is through, uh, reading groups. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, I, 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 I read, but I also have lots of books that I'm avoiding reading and a lot of papers that I'm avoiding reading. So, um, 
being in reading groups with other teachers is a good way to sort of get through those and get new ideas um, and new ways to apply theory to practice. Um, and before this whole situation, I was in one reading group um, and we met like once every month or less than that. Um, and we all had to sort of coordinate physically to get somewhere. Yeah. Um, but it's much easier, actually, if you if you could just um, get online uh, and, and chat to people. So now I'm in, in three reading groups and, you know, uh, expanding my horizons of knowledge <laughs> even more. <laughs> Do you, do you think any of your reading groups will stay online even when even when they don't need to be? Uh, I, I think one of them definitely won't. Um, one of them definitely will, and one of them could go either way, hmm. I would guess. Because um, like, one of them involves people from you know lots of different countries. Um, mm -hmm. One of them is people who all work very close by, and one of them is people who are like, a little bit more spread out around sort of uh, Tokyo and and the surrounding area, um, mm. so yeah, who, who, I'm not sure about that one, but yeah, possibly. Mm -hmm. Well, that that was kind of my last question, really. Do you think out of this anything will be maintained? I mean, we've talked we've talked about teaching, of course, but in terms of kind of professional engagement and you know mm -hmm. teacher development activities, I wonder if any any of the the current way of doing things now will be kind of. Um, taken over to when things are kind of a bit more normal again possibly there's at least talk of that like the conference i attended last week i think afterwards there was people saying oh you know so much fun it was so great and so easy why not make this a regular thing not just a one you know yeah. once a year thing um and i think i heard people talking this weekend this past weekend about the the call conference the you know, the computer assisted language learning conference, um, just keeping it online permanently. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess like um one of the one of the reasons people don't embrace technology is because, you know, they're not incentivized to use it, right? And once they actually are incentivized to use it in some way, then they um they're more likely to start using it regularly. So that was with our, you know, online learning management system thing. I didn't use it until I had to to teach online and now I'm going to keep using it into the future. So I guess it would be the same with these conferences. Now people have seen or they know how to do it. Um, they're probably more likely to keep doing it. Do you think we're going to continue recording podcasts uh, online? Who knows? <laughs> well, yeah, I think speaking for our podcast, it, it, I mean, it's certainly, we, we never really considered it before and we kind of, uh, balked at the idea of doing things online but actually it's not that we tried, we tried it once didn't we i think twice i think we did it twice, twice. yeah but I, but I think even in when whenever that was 2015 i don't think the technology was even there then really was it there's there seems to be a been a bit of a, ma a, a big change in this kind of stuff in the past couple of years mm. yeah there was no zen what we're using for zencaster there was no zencaster <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Zen Customer. <laughs> anyway, just just to wrap up this uh, section, so I'm I'm currently reading a book by a guy called David Gauntlet at the moment called Making Is Connecting, and the premise of the book is that we're we're shifting from a sit back and be told culture to a making and doing culture, and people are rejecting traditional teaching and television and making their own learning and entertainment. So I kind of yeah, I kind of feel that that's what's what's compelling a lot of people at the moment. They're kind of wanting to produce their own their own materials and kind of reach out to people. Okay, so that's today's TEFL news. Um currently untitled. I don't know what to call it, but um yeah, you get the idea. TEFL Pioneers. Okay, uh so to start this episode's uh, TEFL Pioneer segment, I'd like to ask, um, have either of you ever heard of the Pimsleur method or the Pimsleur approach? Have we not discussed it before? I don't think so. No? It sounds very familiar. Yeah, I, it may have come up, but I don't think we've done a segment mm. on it. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a popular approach to language learning that was established by Paul Pimsleur, um, which at some point I'm going to mispronounce as Plimsoll because my brain mm -hmm. is telling me to do that. 
Um, it was originally developed in the sort of 1950s, 1960s, and it's still very common today. Um, so in this segment, I'm going to give some uh, background information about uh, Paul Pimsleur. I'm going to talk about his method, um, and then I'm going to explain a little bit about his um, contributions to the more kind of academic side of language teaching theory. Pimsleur was born on October 17th, 1927 in New York City, and he grew up in the Bronx. Uh, he studied at City College of New York and then moved on to do a master's degree in psychological statistics and a PhD in French, very different disciplines, um, both at Columbia University. Um, he taught French at UCLA uh, and then moved to Ohio State University as a faculty member, where he taught both French and foreign language education. Um, as a person, um, he seems to have been quite sort of humble, quite realistic about language learning. Um, so we've discussed before the idea of hyper polyglots, um, and we've kind of, you know, questioned their true proficiency in all the languages they claim to speak. Um, and Pimsleur was was a reputed to speak a lot of languages, but um, he's quite candid about not knowing quite as many as he was supposed to have known. Um, so I'm just going to quote from his book. Uh, how to learn a foreign language. Um, he says, don't be misled by reputations. Reputations are often overdone. I myself have a reputation for knowing a great number of languages, many more than I actually know. Once, when a class had been pestering me to tell them how many languages I knew, I walked over to a Swedish exchange student in the class and held this conversation with her in Swedish. Are you Swedish? Yes, I am. What part of Sweden are you from? I'm from Linköping. I don't know it. Where is it? A long answer about the location of the town. How long have you been in America? Since... Two sentence answer. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Our conversation lasted for about three minutes. Then I asked her in English whether she had readily understood my Swedish. She said she had. I asked the class whether, in their judgment, I was entitled to claim that I knew Swedish. They replied warmly that surely I could add Swedish to my list of languages, and were disappointed when I told them that I hardly knew Swedish at all and would consider myself fraudulent to maintain that I did. My part in the conversation consisted merely of a few stock phrases and some questions to keep the other person talking. Actually, my questions bore no relation to her answers because I did not understand her, I was prepared to ask the same set of questions regardless of what she said. The amount of Swedish I used in that conversation can be taught to anyone at all in an hour. So I think that's, that's you know, quite, quite an honest way of um, looking at language proficiency. Like most people who perhaps claim they can speak a language aren't, you know, they, they use a lot of these tricks, you know, to mm -hmm. get them through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so he was kind of refreshingly uh, realistic, I guess, about the problems that most language learners face. Um, and he wanted to come up with realistic solutions. And I think this was kind of the inspiration for a lot of his work. Um, so while he was at Ohio State University, um, he got his first sort of major achievement when he created the Listening Center, which was one of the largest language laboratories in the United States at the time. Um, and of course, we talked about language labs a few episodes ago. Hmm. Um, the center focused on self-directed study using tape recordings and telephone prompts. Um, so he actually developed this in um, cooperation with the Bell Telephone Company. Um, so they started integrating telephone technology <laughs> into the language lab. So it was all self-directed, but um, you know they, they used this phone technology to sort of give prompts to the students uh, to practice speaking, I guess. Um, or I guess it was mainly listening. Um, hmm. So this experience led directly to his development of a self-study program, um, which he developed with his wife. Um, they originally started with Greek uh, and then produced further programs for French, German, Spanish, and Twi. I think Twi is, is right. Have you heard of that language? No. Okay, so it's a Ghanaian language. Hmm. Um, so all of uh, these programs adopted what was known as uh, the what what it, what was and is known as the Pimsleur approach. Um, so. The approach is based on four key principles, um, and this is based on Pimsleur's research. Um, in his book, uh, How to Learn a Foreign Language, that we quoted from earlier, he goes through what he considers to be the whys of learning a language, which covers things like uh, which language is the easiest to learn for English speakers, how long it takes to learn a language, and that kind of thing. 
Um, and then he then goes on to the hows of learning a language. Um, and he breaks languages down into grammar, pronunciation, and vocabulary. He says that's basically all a language is, which I think we might disagree with. <laughs> yeah. Um, but of those three, uh, he says that vocabulary is the most difficult, mainly because of memory constraints and the fact there's so much of it. Um, and I agree with that because with with my own foreign language learning, uh, vocabulary is the is the area that I really, really struggle with. And it seems to be the area that a lot of people don't talk about, you know, um, mm -hmm. in, in learning Japanese. Every time I've signed up for a vocabulary lesson, the method has always been study it by yourself and then we'll do a test in class, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I find it really frustrating and annoying. <laughs> um. But uh, yeah, his conclusions about how to learn a foreign language are summarized in the four principles of the Pimsleur approach. Um, the first of these is graduated interval recall, which is basically spaced repetition um, with gradually longer intervals between each encounter with a new word or a new mm -hmm. piece of language. So that's mm -hmm. the first principle. The second is the principle of anticipation um, so quoting from the Pimsleur website, uh, systematic, this, this means systematically asking for understanding, pausing for a response, and then reinforcing the correct response, okay? Um, which apparently increases understanding, accelerates learning, and activates new, uh, new neural pathways in the <laughs> learner's brain, hmm. okay? Um, which... I mean that that sounds to me like a um, what's it called initiation response feedback, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, a very common classroom interaction. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, you know, like the first one is basically spaced repetition. The second one is, you know, a, a very common sequence. Um, so I don't know. I'm and, not sure. Yeah, and and it's meant to do what to the neural? It's meant to create new neural pathways or... to to activate new neural pathways. Activate. <laughs> probably, probably anything activates <laughs> neural pathways right exactly i mean th this comes yeah. from the the sort of the sales copy on the website so it's <laughs> right. it's probably full of I, I don't know pimsler himself i think was not a con man you know he was someone mm -hmm. working in the 1950s 1960s um mm -hmm. and i think he was um you know within that context what he was doing was probably quite scientifically grounded mm -hmm. um but you know these days it's uh, it's it's perhaps not that new. Um, the third point uh, was core vocabulary, um, a focus on a relatively small and restricted number of words at the outset of learning, um, mm -hmm. and then increasing the number of words once the learners have like kind of a, a framework for how words work in this new language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, this seems quite common, quite straightforward, mm -hmm. you know, based on mm -hmm. sort of frequency and usefulness and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and the final one was organic learning. Um, new language is always presented in the context of a conversation or exchange. Hmm. Which again, this this doesn't seem like anything uh, particularly new. Um, but this was the Pimsleur method, these four uh, principles. Um, mm -hmm. And the Pimsleur uh, courses that he designed are still sold and are still very popular today. And they sell themselves on these four principles, which... I guess for us language teachers, they don't sound like anything particularly special. Um, but for language learners, they they maybe they do. I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, and also that you know they don't sound that bad. No, I mean I think they're all good principles, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe if they were in the, it, you know, this is being conducted in the or produced in the context of audiolingualism and so on. Um, mm. maybe they were, uh, you know, a, an interesting alternative at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that was maybe his most um, uh, commercial um, success. Although he wasn't that successful at the time with this, um, it, it, it's become more of a success uh, in later years. Um, but in terms of his academic work, um, he's perhaps best known for the Pimsleur Aptitude Battery Test. Um, okay. So this was meant to predict success in language learning and also to diagnose language learning disabilities. So it, it's a, it's an aptitude test. It's meant to figure out how successful uh, you're going to be if you learn a language, essentially. Um, mm. This was based on research that Pimsleur and his colleagues did between 1958 and 1966. Um, and they developed a test which was based on eight factors. 
Um, and these were intelligence, verbal ability, pitch discrimination, order of language study, and bilingualism. So in what order did you learn the languages you can speak? Um, study habits, motivation and attitudes, and personality factors. Um, and some of those seem a little bit f- floopy. <laughs> so like intelligence, you know, what does that mean? How are we, how are we measuring that? Um, and these have been revised, I think in 2004, um, by, you know, the, his, his research group um, into six points, um, which are kind of reworked versions of those eight points. Um, so now the points are part one, um, grade point average, which replaces intelligence. So the calculated GPA of the person. Um, interest, which uh, measures their interest and their motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, vocabulary, um, which tests knowledge, uh, word knowledge in English uh, and is meant to be a measure mm-hmm. of verbal ability. So that uses English words. Um, and this is where it gets interesting. Part four is language analysis which tests the student's ability to reason logically in terms of a foreign language. Um, And here, they use the grammar of a foreign language to do the test. Mm. So from English with the vocabulary to Mm. uh, a a, a foreign language with the language analysis. Mm. In part five, you have sound discrimination, which tests the ability of uh, students to learn new phonetic distinctions and to recognize them in different contexts. And for this, they use a tonal language, for example, Chinese, mm-hmm. um, in order to you know, test the ability to discriminate between different sounds. Uh, and finally, um, the, the last part is part six, sound symbol association, which tests the ability to associate sounds with written symbols. Uh, and that's another measure of auditory ability. So part five and part six are both focused on auditory ability. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so the test is used to help with diagnosing language learner problems, and also um, it's used to place people into programs and match them to teaching styles and and that kind of thing. Um, have you have you ever come across this kind of test before? No, I haven't. I mean, unless uh, unless you could sort of make a case that it's similar to the sort of diagnostic things for, you know, learning styles, mm. um, which there may be some crossover. I'm not sure. Possibly. But, yeah. yeah. In what, in what, sorry, Rob, say it again. In what cases were, was this, was this test used primarily? Um, it's used uh, to predict success in language learning. So based on these results, how successful are you likely to be in learning another language? Um, and it's also, used to uh, place students in uh, programs that are most suitable to their level of aptitude um, and to match teaching styles to learners. And also it's used to uh, kind of pick up on language learning disabilities, which I'm not quite sure exactly what that means, to be honest. Yeah. I wonder if, if, for example, if you score low in one of these things, does it mean that you would be placed in a course which avoids you having to use that uh, aptitude or would it try and, you know, put you in a, a position where you can improve that aptitude? I guess it would be the second one. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this is not meant to be, um, it's not meant to, like, try and uh, prohibit you from doing certain things in terms of your learning, but more about trying to tail, tailor your learning to your aptitude, I think. Hmm. Um, this, this, sounds like it when, might, this sounds like it might be linked to, like, the common common European framework a bit, you know, having those kind of descriptors for different levels. Mm, possibly. Kind of, you know, a lang- a lang- they talk of like a language portfolio. What what can you do at different levels? Mm. Yeah, I wonder yeah, if it's yeah. re- related in some way. It could be, I guess. Um, I mean, this is for, you know, before you start learning the language, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I think these things are all developed at similar times. So I guess there are lots of the same ideas flying around. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those were his kind of uh, contributions. Um, Pimsleur later moved to, um, <laughs> I, I meant to write State University of New York, but I wrote Statue University of New York, which is <laughs> different. Um, but yeah, at the, at the university, he was professor both of uh, education and of French. Um, 
and he was uh, a founding member of the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. Um, he was also visiting professor at the Sorbonne, um, and unfortunately, he died suddenly of a heart attack on June twenty seventh, nineteen seventy six, during a visit to France um, at the age of forty eight. Hmm. Yeah, so he, he died very young, but he he achieved a lot in his his relatively short life. In terms of his uh, his legacy. Um, since uh, 1977, the uh, American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, um, Paul Pimsler Award for Research in Foreign Language Education um, has been awarded annually. Um, so he had that named after him. Um, his business partner continued to develop his uh, Pimsler courses um, and uh, eventually sold them to Simon and & Schuster. Uh, and as I said, they're still being sold today. They're still very popular. Um, his daughter, Julia Pimsler, created the Entertainment Immersion Method, which is inspired by the Pimsleur approach. Um, and she's also developed a method of teaching for young children. Um, and in 2013, his book, How to Learn a Foreign Language, was reissued by Simon & Schuster um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his first course. Um, and you can buy that online. And also, if you just type the title into Google, you can find a free PDF. But I wouldn't recommend that because it's, uh, <laughs> it's illegal. Um, and you won't get the money for it. Um, yeah, so that, that was this episode's uh, Tuffle Pioneer, um, Paul Pimsler. Tuffle Cultures. Okay, for this episode's Tuffle Culture, um, I want to talk about something um, maybe much like Pimsler, uh, surprised that we haven't discussed it yet, and I'm, I'm still kind of worried that we may have, um, but... My Teflology Google search didn't come up with anything. Um, and that is the teaching of pronunciation. Hmm. Hmm. So do, do either of you recall us using this as a topic before? Not a specific topic, I don't think. We've talked about, you know, things like the IPA and stuff um, hmm. as parts of other topics, I guess. I remember, yeah. I remember us having yeah. a conversation about thinking, like, oh, maybe we should talk about pronunciation one day. <laughs> that's the usual, okay. that's well, the usual conversation that people have because no, nobody really wants to talk about it much do they yeah yeah well today's the day um so maybe an opening question was um back to pimsler and his um his demonstration with the swedish um i mean obviously we don't know and maybe he didn't mention but do you think um the you know how impressed his students were with with his swedish do you think it had anything to do with his pronunciation? Uh, possibly so. Like in in the book, he he puts um, quite a lot of emphasis on pronunciation as being like you know a, a, an important point for language learning. So uh, yeah, maybe so. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then maybe okay, maybe the first question: um, Do either of you teach pronunciation in any of your uh, classes? How would you define pronunciation? Mm. I guess, I mean, I guess it could either way. So, uh, well, phonology, I guess the starting point is deciding that there is a set of phonemes that are traditionally, if, if not, you know, always or exclusively used in, in English or certainly not exclusively, but, mm. um, and raising students' awareness of those phonemes. Mm -hmm. Although obviously um, at the, it's that, that's one level and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I guess okay, either at the 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 phoneme level or the word level or the sentence level. Um, I think the most sort of overt teaching that I do is reactive kind of error mm -hmm. correction mm -hmm. um, with stress, uh, and I think that. And but my my whole approach to teaching pronunciation is very informed by you know the kind of elf intelligibility sort of uh, stuff. Um, so I'll. I'll correct when I feel that what students are producing um, is making them less intelligible, uh, mm. and not just to me, but you know, in in general. Um, yeah, that's that's the the only sort of um, overt teaching that I do. I think. Okay, you yeah. said not not only to you, but in general, and and how do you? What informs your decision about what's intelligible in general? Yeah, um, so I think. Sometimes uh, not a lot informs it. It depends how reactive I'm being. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, 
there are there are, it's now I'm on the spot. It's difficult to to actually name things, but there are I I, I am aware of you know certain research results about what um is more intelligible in certain you know contexts um and I've tried to incorporate that, but now off the top of my head, I can't I can't think of them. Hmm. Yeah. Sure. Um, you said that um it's more reactive. Mm. Um, your sort of corrective feedback is it more is it explicit or implicit generally? Um, usually, well. If it's if it's like one student that's doing it, um, mm-hmm. then it's usually more implicit. Uh, it's more in mm-hmm. the form of recasts. Mm. Um, if it's something that the whole class are doing, so one thing that that um, Japanese students say a lot is clotheses, pluralizing mm-hmm. clothes, um, mm. and then and then singularize it to cloth. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, makes sense. But, yeah, but if if I hear like you know lots of students doing that, then I'll do a whole class focus just on that. Um, because yeah. I think clothes is that's the kind of mistake that I think you know is only. Well, I don't know. I, I've I've only ever come across it with Japanese uh, learners, um, mm-hmm. and I think they're actually taught that in school at some point that that's correct. Or you know, um, you know, I, I feel they must be because everyone does it, um, mm. and I, I feel that that could cause. Uh, intelligibility issues so that's that's you know an example hmm. nice how about you matt yeah, similar to rob really it's very reactive um kind of incidental um i never plan really for it like so for mm. example today i introduced some some words some some words mm-hmm. that were in the reading um and i i you know i, I had them on the paper as you know i could have I don't know, never, never have I kind of, or these days at least, never have I thought about kind of writing the f- phonetic alphabet along with them or doing any sort of focus on how they're pronounced. Um, I, mm. I, I do a lot of kind of, you know, word-based stuff at the moment. No, not, not word-based, I guess that's the wrong term. But um, yeah, I, I don't know, when I introduce a word, I, I, I don't really think about how it how it's going to be spoken or how it's going to sound. I, I kind of, I guess I'm, I think, very textual based recently. Hmm, okay. Yeah. Um, do either of you um, ever use any sort of listen and repeat in the classroom? Um, no. I mean, I, I, do, I do a lot of drilling. Is that what you mean? Um. Yeah, sure. I guess so. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, specifically listen, repeat. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do drilling, and occasionally I'll get the students to repeat back to me. But um, I don't know. I'm kind. Of, I'm I'm lazy with pronunciation. You know, I I, I do drilling, but I I kind of think at times it doesn't have much of a function. It's more of a kind of a mm. performative function. I, I you know the students say it back to me, I say it back to them. But there's no kind of real learning or teaching, maybe that that kind of takes place there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a few years ago when I was teaching, uh, fresh off my TESOL, um, like one element of that is you have to learn how to write the you know phonetic script. Yeah, um, and mm-hmm. I used to include a lot of um, pronunciation teaching in my uh, sort of communication classes, um, and that was before I I sort of read more critical views on, you know, uh, pronunciation models and intelligibility and, and so on. Um, but yeah, I used to like, it was partly, I think, because I'd learned how I'd spent ages learning how to do it. And I thought I'm going to, I'm going to bloody use this because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> such a pain to learn. Um, and now I've totally forgotten. I, I can write, you know, some of the symbols, but I wouldn't be able to transcribe a sentence anymore. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Do, do you think it's important for students to work on their pronunciation? Well, I mean, certainly it, it is, you know, and, you know, I, I hate to say it. Well, no, no, I don't hate to say it is, but it's it's an area of my teaching that I kind of I'm aware that I should be doing more of, I think, because it definitely impacts on the way that learners listen to language as well, because because, you know, mm. connected speech, for example, elision. Um, all those kind of features they're, they're features of pronunciation and they'll they'll impact on how learners are going to hear spoken english mm-hmm. so for me i guess that's that's kind of the most important part of pronunciation being able to kind of discern what's being said 
I think it depends who right. they're going to be speaking to, though, right? Like if you know things like Elision or you know, um, whatever, like connected speech. Um, I mean, that might be the case if they're going to go and do a study abroad trip in the UK or whatever. But mm-hmm. it, you know, it's not necessarily going to be something that's useful to them. Um, I think in terms of classroom priorities, we want to prioritize because you can't teach everything. You want to prioritize the things that are going to be most useful for the students and that are going to fit the students' needs the most clearly. Um, so, like, yeah, I don't know. I I, I don't focus on things like, um, you know, elision and connected speech very much in the same way that I wouldn't focus on, you know, um, a dropped H because yeah. I don't know if they're going to need it. <laughs> hmm. Um, but do do you think that pronunciation, in terms of its importance for students, um, you know, both receptive and productive skills, do you think it, it it gets the right amount of attention in the classroom in general? Maybe not. Maybe it's kind mm. of it seems kind of sidelined. I don't know. Mm-hmm. In terms of, I mean, in terms of like conference talks or whatever, pronunciation doesn't really feature much as as it does with other topics. Hmm. I don't know if that's a kind of a wider um, a wider kind of paradigm that we're in at the moment, you know. Mm-hmm. But hmm. it feels like a bit of a, a bit of a loaded question. Like what like side what what does it mean to to sideline a piece of language? I it's I don't know. Again, like un, unless we know what the students need the language for, then is sidelining you know certain elements of pronunciation any different from sidelining you know the vocabulary you need to work in a hydroelectric power station and if it doesn't fit the needs of students then what's the point for teaching it hmm. um i think maybe i think i don't know about you i think for m- most of my students um in terms of some kind of need needs analysis um, it's very difficult to know, you know, they're, they're it's, um, hard to know sort of what, what future professions they're going to necessarily go into or in what situations they're going to be using English. Mm. Um, um, and so, you know, among all the various, you know, elements of language that, that get focused on, um, yeah, it's hard to know, um, what place. Um, phonology or and and then within phonology what aspects of phonology are going to be useful for students Mm. um but i don't know i I hadn't really thought about it but but just and but listening to you guys i think i maybe i'm starting to think that i am neglecting a little a little bit but then like you said it's it's really hard to know um which area to look at in terms of phonology i thought it was really interesting what you said was about i remember reading a long time ago how you know, the sentence level, you know, things like elision and, and connected speech and, and sentence stress. Maybe I think maybe sentence stress is the, is, was could identified as the most important marker in terms of comprehensibility. Mm. Mm. Um, but as you said, maybe that's, that's much more weighted towards interactions with, with so-called native speakers. And maybe, you know, at the word level, it could be more useful in other contexts. I think there's, yeah. I mean... I- I think students want pre- pronunciation, though. Like, I, I, I bet mm. if you were to ask our students what, you know, mm. if you were to give them a list of what they think is important in terms of priorities, I think mm. they'd put pronunciation quite high. And this kind of came up today in one of my classes. You know, I hate to say it, and I don't really agree with my students on this, but they were kind of, you know, lusting over the native speaker, as they do, and talk, <laughs> talking about how... But they were kind of talking about the, you know, the so-called native speaker and how they they think that's the best type of um, English practice that they're going to get, and they want to be understood by the the native speaker. And you know, of course, I don't really agree with their position, but mm. wouldn't that assume that pronunciation is somehow at the forefront of their kind of their motivation, if if that's how they want to sound and that's what they want to understand and listen to. Well, they, do they want to sound like 
you know, the so-called native speaker, or do they want to be intelligible to the so-called native speaker? Because those are two different things. I, I think they want. Yeah. I think that firstly, they want to be able to understand the native speaker. Mm -hmm. That's the third th thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think. But and, but I think, I think even if it's even if we take the native speaker out of it, I think they I think they want to be understood and want to be able to understand. Um, any other speaker in English, you know, speakers from other countries as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think with, with, even within that larger context, I think phonology still um, can be important. Yeah, I think students are often um, not very aware of, of what they mean when they, mm. so, you know, um, ask for certain pronunciation models. Like there's research um, into students ability to 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 you know um, guess correctly where you know which speakers are so-called native speakers and which ones are not um and you know a lot of the time they 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 can't tell or they choose the wrong speakers from you know various audio mm. recordings um so yeah. when they say you know i want to learn the english of the native speaker um you know they that 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 thing that they're thinking of is you know it's not very clear to them i think necessarily what what they mean by that yeah. they've got an image um but it doesn't necessarily translate over to any concrete linguistic needs sure but i think again i think we could we could even remove the native the native non-native speaker issue i think mm -hmm. um whoever they're using their english to interact with i think they want to be comprehensible you know that's probably a fairly obvious statement um and that phonology could be part of that mm. well that just gets um, you back to intelligibility right yeah yeah, exactly. But again, phonology play, plays a part of that. Um, mm. You know, as as do other the other so called language systems. You know, as does grammar and vocabulary, etc. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying. So a lot of my students, when when they do independent learning activities, they'll they'll just watch a whole movie or they'll watch a a t an, an episode on Netflix, and I don't know. I'm trying to get them to kind of just maybe look at a, a two minute scene. And just kind of break it down like and be very analytical about what's happening in the scene and i think that would include pronunciation as well you know how how is how is a how has that phrase been said to between those two speakers for example mm. and i don't know just mm -hmm. getting them to getting them to be very analytical about it and this this type this expression said in that way had that particular effect and mm -hmm. kind of reflecting mm -hmm. on what you know how that could be useful for them so i don't know I'm, I'm trying to kind of i guess going back to your original question that's that's one thing that i kind of do at the moment so that's mm -hmm. kind of outside of class but yeah but still um yeah i guess i mean one thing i, I feel sometimes feel somewhat guilty about is is i kind of base their intelligibility somewhat on how well i can understand them and Obviously, the longer you spend listening to, for example, Japanese students, um, you probably, you know, get, get used to um, the 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 features of of you know Japanese English, mm. and so I think you know I probably understand my students a lot better um, than I did before I moved here. I mean, I grew up with a Japanese mother, so it's been a, a you know a, a variety of English that I've been familiar with for a long time. Um, but for example, after teaching, you know, lots of Korean students for a long time in London, I became much, I think I, you know, improved my ability to understand Korean students. Um, and so maybe if those intelligibility issues don't affect me so much, I, maybe I, I, I don't address them as much, but then I think it also comes to the point of, you know, I, it, sort of back to what we were talking about before. It's like, how do I, how do I decide what's intelligible? Yeah, I think that that all comes down to you know um, to doing a needs analysis for your students. What do they, what do they need mm. the language for? And I guess you know a needs analysis can um, can be used along with. I, I don't know that much about needs analysis, but like a, a desire analysis, like not so much <laughs> what do they <laughs> what do they need it for, but what do they want it for as well. Mm. Um, mm. So you know, those aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, yeah, but you know, you, again, you have to be kind of realistic like I, I i had students who who came and said you know i want to learn british english um mm. 
I've joined your class for three weeks. Well, <laughs> you're not going to learn. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I think you have to be sort of realistic with students as well. And you have to prioritize, even if, you know, you're going to teach them pronunciation features that are suitable for, you know, particular interaction with particular groups of people, you still have to prioritize certain features of the language. Like in Japanese, you know, the famous difficulty is uh, the r and l difference. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've never successfully taught the difference between those two, to be honest. Um, mm. I've never had a student come out at the end of the class being able to fully distinguish them. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, some of my best students can't do that still. Um, and, mm. and, you know, it doesn't cause any problems. Yeah. yeah. So, like, is, is it really worth spending all the time and effort of the class focusing on that mm-hmm. one little thing when you could be focusing mm-hmm. on something else? And the same with something like elision. Like, yeah, it, may, mm-hmm. it might make you sound more natural, but it also makes you more difficult to understand to most people, including probably the people you're trying to speak to. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, uh, have, you, have either of you ever seen, it's, I'm sure it's still somewhere on the internet, there's a, a, a clip of Adrian Underhill doing a sort of little um, pronunciation workshop. I don't think so. Um, and it's with a it's with a sort of very international class, um, and he, he's he's focusing on phonemes in this particular uh, talk. But I think he models it once. I think he, the different phonemes. I can't remember if it's it might be words, but it might be phonemes. He models them once, but he says I'm only going to model them once. Mm-hmm. And then he he asks you know various students of different nationalities to produce their version of that phoneme. Mm-hmm. And he 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 really stresses to the students that you know that's you know, that's your version. You know, it doesn't have to be the same as mine. It doesn't have to be the same as all, as all your classmates. Um, but it's, you know, if it's, if it's something that you have and you're working towards, then that's fine. Yeah. Um, well, it's the same for us, isn't yeah, it? We all pronounce differently on our podcast. Yeah, exactly. some, some of us better <laughs> yeah. than others. I don't know. You two sound <laughs> the same to me. But... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that was this episode's TEFL culture. Um, teaching and maybe learning, pronunciation and or phonology. Thank you very much for listening today. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send an email to teflology at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at teflology. Uh, you can like our Facebook page. Uh, you can leave a review on iTunes or wherever you uh, download your podcast from. Uh, We also have a book, Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, which is available on Amazon and from theround.com. And we also have on our website, teflology-podcast.com, we now have a place where you can donate to the podcast. Um, So if you've got something out of this show over the past five years, um, if you want to show us your support and appreciation, um, if you go to teflology podcastcom and you can donate directly to the show and we'll put all of that money back into the show, of course. So, uh, yeah, please consider um, showing your support. So it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>